So this is a short follow-up piece to the uh, article about Richard Dawkins uh, and his views on abortion and death syndrome that I read in last week's audio blog. Um, the response that we got from that piece when it was published was quite remarkable. And basically, I wanted to talk a little bit about that and make a finer point. There's a sense where there's sort of a case study here for something that we talk about, um, where you can really compare and contrast the responses from pro-choice people to the article that I had written about Richard Dawkins' views versus some of the articles that have been written by other pro-life advocates regarding that. And um, I thought it was a remarkable enough uh, thing that it would be worth talking about just a little bit um, and doing that compare and contrast. And I'm sorry if this post comes across a little bit self-congratulatory. That's not like the point, but I'm aware, especially in this time where virtue signaling is such a thing <laughs> on social media and kind of um, how to think about that is, uh, is something that we're kind of still thinking about. Um, you're just going to have to trust me when I say that this is not a piece that's intending to do virtue signaling or patting ourselves on the back. It's meant to point at a really helpful and clear example of how if you do this thing, which is to be extra intentional about understanding people and having clarity and then responding to their views, um, the, the difference that that can make when pro-choice people, um, even very, very pro-choice people, um, read it. And I think there's, there's a few really, really good examples of that in this piece. So this is Richard Dawkins retweeted my article and what we can learn from that. As you may have heard, the Twitterverse exploded in late August when Richard Dawkins tweeted that it would be immoral to not abort a baby diagnosed with Down syndrome. He wrote a blog post clarifying his views on the following day, and I wrote an article to help pro-life people understand what Richard Dawkins actually believes. I explained that while his view is offensive and I disagree with it, it does follow naturally from Dawkins' beliefs that first trimester babies are not yet persons. Here is an excerpt from the article on why I wrote it. Just like in any dialogue with a pro-choice person, we should start by trying to understand Dawkins' views. And after what I've seen on social media in the last week, I'm concerned that many pro-life people don't get where he's coming from. We should be trying to figure out the answer to this question. Why is Dawkins particularly in favor of abortion when the child is diagnosed with Down syndrome? I'll give you a hint. It's not that he hates people with Down syndrome. I strongly disagree with Dawkins' views on abortion, but now that I've read his article, I'm going to try to explain why I believe his view isn't as offensive as his first tweet was. One of the reasons we launched Equal Rights Institute is to help pro-life and pro-choice people to have better dialogues. I believe a necessary condition of having a good dialogue is accurately understanding what the person in front of you actually believes, which is rarely clear in the beginning of a conversation. I think trying to get into Dawkins' shoes will be a good exercise. End quote. To read the rest of the article, go to EqualRightsInstitute.com slash Dawkins. The day after I published the article, Richard Dawkins himself retweeted it to his one million followers. So then I posted a screenshot of the tweet that Richard Dawkins retweeted, which is from a guy named Sean Martin, who wrote, Upset about Richard Dawkins' comments about Down syndrome? Read Josh Brom article, Helps to Understand Dawkins. And Richard Dawkins retweeted that tweet. As you can imagine, our Twitter feeds blew up, and I began engaging philosophical atheists on the question of abortion. Ultimately, the article got more than 7,000 views and hundreds of tweets and Facebook shares. Even more gratifying were some of the comments we got under the article, and I posted screenshots of just two of those comments, and I'll read those to you. The first one is from a guy named Benjamin who writes, It pains me a little to have to admit that the most charitable, most fair-minded, most accurate, most logical, and least emotional analysis of the whole Richard Dawkins on Down syndrome and abortion furor has come from a pro-life religious activist. Thank you. End quote. And then another guy named Matthew writes, As a pro-choice person, I've always believed the pro-life crowd makes their arguments with the best of intentions. I very much appreciate your attempt here to see the best in the person with whom you disagree. Would that we could all approach contentious issues in this manner. Bravo. And I responded to him writing, Thanks so much, Matthew. That means a lot. I believe if everybody on both sides tried to see the other argument in its best light, we would find more truth and the process would be a lot more fun as well. Albeit it would also be intellectually harder, but I'm okay with that. End quote. The approach of the article was different than what pro-choice people would expect from a pro-life advocate. But look at the impact it had on pro-choice people and the opportunities for conversations it gave us. It takes a lot of patience and discipline to put this approach into practice, but it is worth it because the results are so much better than the results I used to get with my old approach. 
I used to post Facebook statuses and tweets along the lines of, here's what this pro-choice person said, and here's why that doesn't make sense. Those Facebook statuses would get support from the other pro-life people, but pro-choice people never responded. They probably rolled their eyes and moved on. My tweets linking to the Dawkins piece had a different result. Many pro-choice people actually considered the piece, and they reacted positively to it. People who do not generally read pro-life articles got to see the pro-life movement a little differently. Here's the point. When you go out of your way to understand people, even when they offend you, they notice. You help create an environment where you can have meaningful conversations with others, which does not happen if you just follow the temptation to dismiss their view. Our goal at Equal Rights Institute is to train the pro-life movement, especially college students, to be able to create an environment for dialogue that actually changes people. Thank you so much for your prayer and financial support. 